Welcome to Medical Matters Weekly with Dr. Trey Dobson, presented by Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and Catamount Access Television. Welcome, everyone. Today is April 14th, 2022, inching towards spring and into spring here in Vermont. Uh, we are recording this show for our April 20th broadcast. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of health and health care that matter to you most. My guest today is national best-selling author Richard Louvre. Richard, did I pronounce your last name correct? I didn't even ask you before we started. You did. A lot of people get it wrong, so thank you. Um, and thank you so much for being here. His, his books address our relationship with nature and other animals, and of course, into the health and wellness of what those relationships foster. Uh, just a little bit on his background, and of course, you can look Richard up. We'll have links in the show notes. Uh, he's a journalist and author of over 10 books, including Our Wild Calling, How Connecting with Animals Can Transform Our Lives and Save Theirs, and Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. Uh, so, And also one that I know that some of our physicians um, have recommended, which is vitamin N. So we can talk about these. Uh, he's translated and published in 24 countries, uh, served in many positions, uh, and has been a journalist and continues to be and is a winner of the National Audubon Medal. So again, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Where, where are you right now? Um, I live, my wife and I live in Julian, California, which is a little town up in the mountains east of San Diego. And when we moved here three years ago, it was like moving to Vermont. I mean, it's that different uh, from uh, uh, San Diego. We have, I, we have mountain lions in the yard, so. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's really connecting with nature. That is, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, but you, you mentioned you've been to Vermont, so you're familiar with the area for sure. Yeah. It's, Tell us a little bit about, about your background then, where you, where you grew up. Um, I grew up in Missouri and Kansas, uh, both sides of the border around Kansas City. And, this, and um, I kind of grew up in the woods. We lived on the suburban edge of Kansas City. And behind our house was a big, big uh, cornfield. And beyond that was the woods that seemed to go on forever. And I spent uh, much of my boyhood in those woods, in those fields uh, with my dog. Uh, my parents often did not know where I was, but my dog always did. And, and that shaped you, I am certain, uh, for in your years and in, into adulthood. Yeah, I was very privileged. I was lucky. I was lucky to have parents who valued nature. I was lucky to have nature nearby. Uh, simply having access to nature, though, doesn't mean that people will use it. When I did interviews for Last Child in the Woods, I went back to my old neighborhood and my, my grade school and interviewed uh, kids and teachers and parents there. What I found was that... Uh, my woods were pretty much gone, even though I'd pulled out hundreds of, I think hundreds, maybe dozens of survey stakes that I knew had something to do with the bulldozers taking out other woods. I think I held them off for a while. I had a, had a developer in LA tell me when he heard that, that I would have been a lot more effective if I'd simply moved the stakes around. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was lucky. I was lucky to have that. My, my woods were gone, but then I went to the the new edge of Kansas City, where it was just like where I grew up with. The houses were right backed up against uh, nature and kids were not going out there. Uh, so access isn't everything. It's essential, but it's not everything. You have to want to be in nature. You have to understand uh, it a, a little bit more. And that's really the area that is deficient right now, unless you live in an inner city in which there's no nature at all. And that's a whole another issue because uh, I think that's a life and death issue. When there's no nature in inner cities. Your description of pulling up those stakes, I mean, obviously it, it, it's reminiscent of an Edward Abbey or, or a Carl Hyacin maybe uh, book. And do you think that at the time that you um, were growing up and, and out there with your dog, that you recognized uh, the connection or do you think it was years later? Uh, the connection to 
my well-being or health your or, well-being to health to, to the outdoors i mean i just tell you personally had very similar experience uh growing up and i feel blessed as you as you mentioned and i do believe i recognized it but then you talk about you know people who don't take advantage of that yeah. um access i think i did i wouldn't have said it was health you know i wouldn't have categorized it that way it was just a feeling uh, uh in a way it's the feeling of what I described in my last book is about our relationship with animals, particularly wild animals. It's our wild calling is the name of it. And uh, in that, I describe what many, many people told me about their encounters with wild animals in particular, and what they felt during those encounters. And what they felt was that there was something between them and the wild animal, literally something between them. Uh, and in the book, I call it the habitat of the heart. And I think there are two habitats. There's the physical habitat uh, of nature that we work hard, many of us, to protect and teach our kids about. But then there's this other habitat, the habitat of the heart. And we do hardly anything to teach kids about that, to even recognize it in ourselves. I guess it borders on a spiritual sense, but it's psychological. It's, um, it's a recognition of the other animal's worth. Uh, it's personal. The thing is, of those, of those two habitats, if one of those goes, so does the other one. That's why I think it's so important to focus on both. Absolutely. And again, back to that initial question, um, that's exactly what I was alluding to, that, that awareness that someone experiences. If they haven't experienced that, um, despite the access there, they may never go seek it out. And again, that's how, that's where I feel blessed that somehow I got out there. Maybe it was the teachings of my, my father or parents, or maybe it was just out of uh, the desire to explore, like you said, uh, outside of your neighborhood and, and into the surrounding woods. So from there, how did you then get started into a career and particularly in, in journalism? I wasn't very good at anything else. So that's the uh... <laughs> That's the main thing. Um, um, you know, I, I was Walter Mitty. I wanted to do everything. So journalism is perfect for that, or at least it used to be. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I get together with my old, old buddies from the newspaper days. And, you know, we, uh, I often point out that we worked for a, a newspaper in the golden age of journalism. And all we did is whine because we were journalists, that's what journalists did. So I was very lucky in that regard too. So um, you, you got into journalism and then I assume, did you start right away um, writing about nature and animals and relationships or did you explore other aspects before you uh, found your calling there? Now from the beginning, that was a theme. I wrote about lots of things I was, for 24 years, I was a columnist for the San Diego Union Tribune, and I covered trends, which meant whatever I was interested in that week. And uh, um, all kinds of trends, technological trends, political trends, uh, migration. I, I covered the Mexican migration uh, into the United States and uh, uh, the, the shift to the Sun Belt, another type of migration. Uh, but always there was this theme that kept coming up, which was our connection to nature. Uh, and I've written 10 books. And when I look back through those books, there's either a chapter or it's woven throughout the book about the human relationship with nature. It's not just about nature itself. It's about our relationship with it. When I've written about urban design, it's, it's in those books too. Uh, so this kind of grew. And then I started seeing some of the studies that showed two things. One was the disconnect of children in particular, but all of us, uh, between us and, and the natural world, which is really growing fast in the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s. And then this other body of evidence of research that showed how great nature is for our mental health, our physical health, our sense of well-being, our cognitive functioning, our ability to learn and create, all that was being, 
beginning to show up after a long period when the academic world had basically ignored the impact of nature on the human organism, but they were catching up fast. I, I should point out when I wrote Last Child in the Woods, which is the first of the four books about what I called nature deficit disorder, um, I could only find about 60 studies. I was particularly interested in the ones about the benefits, the health benefits, education mm -hmm. benefits. I, I was really stunned by that. It's kind of the elephant in the room, literally, that something so large, so important had been virtually ignored in terms of, of its effect. Uh, now, if you go to the Children's Nature Network website, which is the nonprofit that grew out of Last Child in the Woods, which is childrenandnature.org, you'll see uh, uh, summaries of over a thousand studies. So it's become yeah. something of a, a growth industry since 2005 uh, to study these. And it's, they're very much, it's, it, it's a topic now that is talked about often. It was not in 2005. The pandemic has speeded up that, uh, that conversation as you might guess as a doctor. Do you think that the efforts that are coming out of this research, I mean, research is fantastic when it shows us the problem and brings, brings that awareness and, and justifies that the problem exists. I, I assume there's also, um, and I'm not familiar with it, so uh, I, I will ask you, research on uh, different ways to uh, enhance the relationships or actually improve uh, the access to children and frankly, everyone, uh, but of course, you're talking about children and their relationships as they develop. Well, the, it, there's research, not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll probably never be satisfied that there's enough research, but you know, uh, Dr. Howie Frumkin, who is the head of the uh, Center for Environmental Health for the CDCs, and then became, you may know him, uh, Trey, he became the head of the public health department uh, 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 program at uh, University of Washington, he likes to say on this issue, he likes to say, yes, we need more studies, but we know enough to act. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we've known enough to act for quite a while. Um, so, you know, to, but what's happening, what's great is that there has been a kind of movement that's emerged to my surprise, to many of our surprises. Um, the, it includes doctors. I spoke to the, uh, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, their national conference in 2010. And first I was stunned that they'd asked me to give their keynote, their opening keynote. I mean, nature deficit disorder, really? You know, that began as kind of a tongue in cheek phrase, but people really took to it and it's entered several languages now. And, uh, but still, I wonder, that's, you know, and uh, before I went up to San Francisco to give that, my wife, who's a nurse practitioner, was, she's retired now, took my face mm -hmm. in her hand and said, Rich, pediatricians are different from other doctors. They're really, really nice. <laughs> so now I've offended all the other doctors. But she corrected it quickly. They're all, they're all nice. But I led with that and got off on a good start. The, but the pediatricians really responded to this and many of them went back and changed their practices. There's a guy named Dr. Robert Zard uh, who went back to Washington DC and began to literally write prescriptions to nature, which is now getting fairly common. And he didn't stop there. He organized his other fellow doctors and uh, pediatricians in DC and then they together created a database of all the parks and open space in DC. So the doctor could not only write the prescription to the family, but could turn to his or her uh, computer and say, there's a park a block and a half from your house. Here's what you can do there to fulfill your nature prescription. So that spread, it spread to other countries too. It's taken off in Canada. Even pharmacists now are, uh, giving a kind of prescription to, to to nature time. And it's real and it does have an effect. And, and we've actually seen it talking about research. Um, it's a little harder to measure than specific uh, interventions for uh, an identified disease, but it certainly uh, improves well-being. And I agree with uh, what you were saying that about the, we have 
we need more research, but we have a plenty to act. So, so your last book, interestingly, I, I can relate very much to what we're talking about personally, and I know the audience can as well, since much, much of our audience lives in rural areas. Uh, but your most recent book talks about human relationships with animals, and you even mentioned with domesticated animals. So can you give us a little bit of insight there? Uh, of course, we'll learn more when we all pick up your book and read it. Well, you know, uh, domesticated animals are in the book, not only dogs and cats, but uh, other domesticated animals and the relationships that people have with them, which often are life-changing, uh, life-shaping, uh, remarkable uh, relationships. We know about pets. We've, there's a lot of research on that. There's a lot of people using their psychologists using animal-assisted uh, therapy, for example. Uh, we don't know much about the impact of wild animals on our mental health, on our uh, psychology. There's, as I said, there's over a thousand studies now, but most of those focus on green space. And there's a kind of assumption that animals are in that green space, wild animals. Uh, but I, I was really interested in what happens to people in those encounters, in those relationships they have with with animals, uh, in, in particularly wild animals. So I collected hundreds of sto stories that people sent me by email or I interviewed them about these things. And, and some of these folks said that I was the first one they'd ever told that story to because they were a little embarrassed by it because it had such a profound impact on them. Um, go ahead. No, I, I agree. And, and I, I was, all I was going to say is it's my own personal experience, but also talking with friends when they encounter a true wild encounter, uh, it, it doesn't just last for the initial adrenaline rush. <clears throat> it lasts weeks. They want to tell more people about it or if they don't want to tell people about it. Uh, it, it affects them. It, even people that frequently encounter wild, wild animals, um, it, whether that's, you know, in Vermont, that's going to be mostly bear. Uh, moose, uh, but out your way, mountain lion, uh, and uh, it, it, it's a lasting impact for sure. And I, I guess that is probably what you're implying you found in, in your research. Yeah, and these stories were remarkable. And they had themes that, that seemed to repeat themselves often. People talked about, they, they described several um, almost alternative states that people fall into when they have these encounters. Uh, your sense of scale changes depending on which animal it is. Um, time seems to slow down or stop. And that's, for instance, a guy who's an oceanographer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, told me about his encounter on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean with a giant octopus. Time slowed down. In fact, it stopped when it grabbed him and it did. And they had, they had quite an experience together. Uh, uh, it's not enough time to tell it here, but I tell it in the story, in the book. And the, uh, so, um, but the, the most, the thing that was most striking is how people describe that moment of awareness between the other animal and themselves. And that uh, thing between them, um, uh, Martin Buber, the great philosopher, and I always have to be careful not to say Justin Bieber. Uh, Martin Buber uh, wrote an essay, a great essay, a couple, few decades ago called I Am Thou. And it was about the relationship between people. And he said basically that you and I don't exist, not really. What exists is between us. It's the relationship. And he thought of it, that word relationship, a little differently than I do. Uh, most of the time. He thought of it as a kind of electricity that some people uh, uh, believe is God. And uh, I'm not overtly religious. Uh, and, but I think that there's a, a, a deep truth in that. We feel that with animals too. Uh, just briefly, I tell you about in, in domestic animals and pets. A, a woman in Toronto, a mother, told me that she walked into the living room one day and her six-year-old son was on the carpet laying down. In front of him was their big dog named Jack, stretched out, and he had his arm around him. And uh, 
she heard her son say, mommy, I don't have a heart anymore. And she says, well, what are you saying? What do you mean by that? And without looking up, uh, the little boy said, my heart is in Jack, the dog. Wow. That permeability, that connection that can be so close. We feel that with people. We also feel that with other animals. And I think during the pandemic, this has really been noticed by a lot of people that when we went into seclusion, you know, many folks looked out the window and for the first time realized there were birds out there and they watched wild animals you know, a coyote or a possum come through their, their backyard. And one of the reasons I believe that that had such an impact on people during COVID was that, as you know, there's a loneliness epidemic in the world that's been growing. Mm -hmm. uh, the human isolation now is connected to many of the same diseases uh, as smoking and, and obesity. And we are increasingly isolated as a species. So this species loneliness, as I read about it in Our Wild Calling, you know, is a profound uh, aspect of who we are as human beings. Um, we do not wanna be alone in the universe. This is part of who we are. Mm -hmm. Our relationship with other animals helps us with that, helps us not feel so alone. That's what people felt during the pandemic when they felt they're most isolated. Sometimes they took the most comfort, you know, in the bird that built a nest outside their window. Um, and I think this is often overlooked. You know, we, environmentalism conservation tends to talk in data, you know, in numbers. But this habitat of the heart, this thing between us and other species, it was extraordinary. And the more that science learns about how animals communicate between themselves within their own species, across species, how trees communicate with us also, but with each other. It's, it's growing very, very complex in the portrait that science is, is painting of that communication that's out there. So I think there's a kind of whisper around us. There's a conversation going on around us all the time and we don't notice it. And when we do notice it though, we do not feel as alone in the universe. So, so is the next step then, Richard, identifying the barriers that are inhibiting um, our connections that maybe were just a part of life years ago um, and working on those barriers? I mean, there's the obvious barriers that we talk about, electronic barriers, but there's also complexity in life, you know, life has become unfortunately more complex. You are expected to be uh, in, in more meetings. You're expected to do, you know, more things that aren't necessarily at all getting, getting outdoors. And, and I know when I talk to patients, we, we talk about life's complexities uh, causing, you know, mental, um, mental difficulties due to stress, but you're alluding to it also leads to loneliness and lack of relationship with nature in this situation. Lack of relationship with each other. That's one of the interesting things about, uh, you know, families that spend more time outside with their kids, they tend to bond more. Um, uh, just a few days ago, I, I participated, in order to write about it, participated in a nature therapy session. Uh, a woman up here who's studying to be um, an eco-psychologist, a nature therapist, took a group of people, a small group out into the forest here. And first thing she said is, I'm not the therapist. Nature's the, ther the therapist. That's great. And throughout the day, I, you know, I, I tend to be skeptical as a journalism, but I saw, heard things that people said as they had this experience after experience of noticing nature, connecting with it, that it was profoundly um, therapeutic to them. And as I realized later, it's pretty therapeutic for me too. So is that the, like the sort of symbiotic uh, relationship? You mentioned the word symbiocene, which actually I'm not sure I'm familiar with. What, what do you mean by that term? Um, th that's a term from Glenn Albrecht, who's a, a, a eco-philosopher in, in Australia, uh, this symbiocene. 
symbiosis. Basically, what that is is that pe people talk about the Anthropocene. That's that's human centered. Literally, the word means you know people at the middle of it. You know, and we're so important as a species. You know, we're so full of ourselves that we named the whole next era to be all about us. It's all about us. And uh, so Glenn says, we've got to stop thinking that way. We, we need something better than that. And by symbiocene, he means that we're not in charge of everything, but we need partners. We need allies. And the rest of nature is, can, can be our ally. Uh, these animals we've talked about are our allies. And we can create a better future in symbiosis with the rest of life, rather than always feeling we have to dominate it all the time. In your, in your work, Vitamin N, you mentioned uh, 500 ways to enrich the health and happiness of the family and the community. Do you have a particular favorite way? And that's probably not fair out of 500, but uh, maybe one or two you want to highlight? Well, for parents, and this was true for my wife and I too, one of the simplest things, and there, there's, there are 500 things in that book. It's the kind of book that I actually don't like to read, but I knew had to be written because I was getting so many great ideas sent to me by parents and teachers and others and doctors and others. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but one of the most basic is uh, put it on the calendar. You know, we put soccer on the calendar. Why can't we put nature experience on the calendar? Absolutely. And secondly, go with your child. Don't, don't expect this to happen on its own. It did when I was a kid, but it doesn't really very much. Maybe in some rural areas it might, but rural kids often have what I call nature deficit disorder as well. Mm -hmm. um, so don't take it for granted and go with your kids. And the third thing is don't pretend to be an expert at, about everything. You know, this isn't this nature connection we talk about. It's not parents hovering over kids in the woods with nature flashcards. You know, it's experiencing it with them. And what I learned from parents and kids is that sometimes the experience is even better when the parents and the child are uh, equally uh, unknowing about the particular plant they're looking at. They neither of them know the name of it or the animal that just walked by. And they both have this sense of awe and wonder at the same time. That's what kids, particularly small kids, remember with their parents. They don't remember the name of that animal that walked by. As they get older, they do. But what they re remember most is that shared sense of magic with their parents when they are outdoors in nature. Oh, that's such great advice. And, and most people have at least experienced it at one time or another with their children, if they have children and know exactly what you're talking about, uh, but probably don't put it on the calendar enough. So that is super advice. As, as we finish up here, tell us what you're looking forward to uh, it personally or professionally. Like everybody else, I wish COVID would go away faster. Yes. Um, uh, I, I, because of COVID in part, I spent a lot more time walking in these mountain in the mountains where I live. And um, I'm working on myself. I'm not that good at connecting to nature, I have to admit. I'm better than many people, but there's a lot that I have to learn. And one of the things I realized when I was walking one day is that I was really missing daily journalism. I was really missing my fellow journalists who tend to be uh, the most serious and the most irreverent people that I know at the same time. I was missing that culture and miss, missing noticing things. I missed walking into a room with a bunch of people and noticing that the politician over there has a red pen in his pocket and taking that detail and all the detail in the room back to me, back with me to write the article. To, to absorb all of that. And then while I was walking, I realized I'm doing that right now. I just saw some wild turkeys walk by, yeah? Uh, I just heard something in the trees. I saw something on the peripheral, per, uh, my peripheral vision that I'm not sure what it was. 
So I was noticing the whole time I was in nature and I hadn't noticed that I was noticing. So, um, you know, we can all, uh, certainly I can uh, do this better than I have been. It, it, gets, uh, it gets better over time. And we, uh, I find during COVID in particular, I really needed that personally. Richard, thank you so much for being on our show today. Thanks so much, Trey. I'd also like to thank Mike Cutler from CAT TV, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity. Get outdoors. We'll see you next week.